how did Trump become president? Professor uh, Kathleen Hall Jamison is with us. She's the director of the Annenberg School for Communications Public Policy Center, and she's the author of a brand new book, uh, holding it in my hand here, Cyber War, How Russian Hackers and Trolls Helped Elect the President. And uh, uh, Dr. Hall, or Dr. Jamison, uh, or Hall Jamison, welcome to the program. Yeah, call me Kathleen, please. It's nice to be with you. Thank you, Kathleen. So uh, tell us the story. How, how, how do you know that had Russia not intervened in the elections, Donald Trump would not be president? Well, I can't say that I know it. I can say that I have a very strong case for it. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, I surmise it from the case. Uh, first, there was enough troll activity uh, that was well enough aligned strategically with Trump's interests. That is, mobilize evangelicals and Christian Catholics, mobilize military and veteran families, suppress or minimize African-American voting and voting by Sanders supporters, and switch anyone who is not inclined to not vote to switch over rather than to Hillary Clinton over to Jill Stein. And that the content of the trolls was evocative, uh, based on prejudice, fear, anger, the sorts of things that create viral dissemination and create effective contagion. And as a result, everything they had was well aligned to influence people. We don't know whether it did in the three key states because we don't yet have the data knowing which computers received the material. The platforms know that. If they would tell us that, we could know how strong the case is. The second part of the case is the hackers. The hackers did create a massive impact. We saw hacked, hacked content in our news on an ongoing basis. You're talking Disrupted. Hillary Clinton's emails and John Podesta's Hillary, emails. John Podesta's, not, not Hillary Clinton's emails, but the emails of her staff, mm. uh, John Podesta's emails, uh, DNC traffic. D they also hacked the DCCC, Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. In the process, they got voter turnout models, and they got the complete model for the turnout for the Clinton campaign which would increase the likelihood, if they were skillful, that the troll content would have gone to the right places. Hmm. Uh, and, but more importantly, when you're asking, how do I know what I know, they changed the media agenda. They not only affected the Clinton campaign, Debbie Wasserman Schultz resigned uh, at the Democratic National Convention, they made it harder to consolidate the Sanders vote because of the content that was hacked and leaked and then judiciously massaged by the Republicans and magnified by news. The do hacked documents that were released very strategically on October 7th, blunted the impact of the Access Hollywood revelations about Donald Trump by putting a competing Hillary Clinton narrative in news and eliminated from news the other element that was at play that day, the report of the uh, national intelligence community that the Russians were behind the hackers. So hmm. by releasing that content on that day, they changed the news agenda, took a news agenda that otherwise would have had two anti-Trump stories. Russians did the hacking at Access Hollywood tape and instead created a balance with Hillary Clinton's private revelations versus Donald Trump's private versus public behavior. And then, since they dripped it out throughout October, they changed the media agenda to create more negative messaging against Hillary Clinton. We see a drop in her perceived qualification during that time period that's difficult to attribute to anything else. And hacked content was used in the last two debates in ways that made Hillary Clinton and look bad. We also picked that up in a survey. And we know it was the Russians who hacked this content. We know that the national intelligence community agrees that it was, yes. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty damning. Um, what, what do we do with this? Well, first, we, we ask, what was the role of each of the players, and are they doing enough to create disincentives for other countries to do it and to protect us from it? Um, and and there, we've got a whole sort, all sorts of dimensions at play. I mean, the government has indicted individuals who are responsible for the hacking and for the troll content. Right, these 12 Russians. Economic, uh, the Russians. And, and this is Mueller in both cases. And they have levied through Congress, and the president did sign it. They have levied sanctions against them, and they've got them indicted. So if they could ever get their hands on them, they'll try them. But that hasn't stopped them. They're still meddling in our system. So we can say, well, there's an effort there, but that, that hasn't done it yet. Uh, then secondly, what are the platforms doing? Uh, we could spend two hours on how difficult it is for the platforms. By platforms, you mean Facebook, Twitter, et cetera? Uh-huh. Yep, okay. yep. Um, it's, it, but the first thing they can do is prevent it from coming in. Right. And one, the one thing that they have done is tried to find a way not to let them advertise on the platforms. Um, and they're, they're doing that by making sure that they verify that the person who is buying the ads has a U.S. address. 
Now, that doesn't eliminate the possibility that some foreign power gets a U.S. address, puts a plant in and does it, but it makes it more difficult. Um, and one of the funnier moments in the original first hearings that happened in October, November 2017, occurred when a member of the committee said, well, how, you know, how clear, you know, how smart did you have to be to figure out they were Russians? They were buying ads in rubles. Mm. Well, they didn't do that very much. In fact, one of the things they were indicted for was stealing identities of people in the United States in order to use them as a fake conduit through which to buy content. Uh, the other thing that they're doing is trying with the content that comes in that is problematic, both from U.S. sources and non, to put fact-checking up against it. And I run factcheck.org, so we're actually part of that, mm -hmm. in the hope that when people search for misinformation, not knowing it is misinformation, that there will be corrective content up next to it. And if I, people will read the correction before they read the misinformation, we increase the likelihood they won't believe the misinformation. Yeah. So that's actually an important step. They're also trying to increase the likelihood that we know who's behind content. And so Google on YouTube is putting up disclaimers on air when the content is government-sponsored. Now, that means, for example, that you will know that RT is actually what used to be called Russia Today, and so you're watching a Kremlin-sponsored channel. And those videos from RT are from a Kremlin sponsored um, you know, nation, or they're from Kremlin sponsors. But it also means that our PBS is also identified as having some government support. So they're trying to disclose the source of things to increase the likelihood that we, we assess we, whether we want to believe them based on source. Yeah, I get it. Uh, we just have a minute left before we're going to hit a hard break here. One of the things that I've noticed on Twitter, uh, I've got you know over 100,000 followers, and so I, get, I think I'm a target for this. Um, uh, people will come on and they'll say something very well crafted. I mean, you know, and it's what would have been in an ad, but it's not the ad. It's just a, it's a comment that just, you know, takes down some Democratic talking point or whatever. And when I look at the profile of the person, I discover that they've got 12,000 tweets and five followers, which says to <laughs> me that, that it's a bot or something. And so, you know, I block them. But, uh, you know, how, how does Twitter handle that? Should they go to a you must demonstrate the, you know, use your real name kind of policy? No more... No more pseudonyms. Well, well, one, one, the anonymity or pseudo, pseudonymity um, of the platforms makes it easier to disguise who you are, right. um, and. So the, the, the question is, you know, should they at least verify that the person who is posting is a real person? Right. So forget whether it's actually a person by your name who is actually you. First, do we know it's a real person? Right. Because when bots are able to surge against content, they increase the likelihood that we feel as if our community has endorsed it before we've wow. ever thought about it. Yeah. And there's a persuasive effect behind that that can be pernicious. Also, when you look at the Twitter followers, you know, a reasonable number of those turned out to be bots. Professor Kathleen Hall Jamison, hang on.